Hello everyone and welcome to another MoTeC webinar. Today's subject is how to set up closed loop wideband lambda control. Uh, just a couple of things about this webinar. Um, I'm not uh, doing anything on narrowband lambda control in this webinar. Uh, that's probably a, a subject for another webinar. It's the wideband lambda control that uh, most people are interested in. Um, I'll also be concentrating on the M800, 400, 600 and M84 ECUs. Um, the information is similar to uh, uh, the information if you were using an M4 or an M48 but it's the current ECUs which I will be concentrating on today. The subjects for today are what is closed loop lambda, um, upgrades and equipment that you'll need for the function, some um, information on engine tuning, uh, the lambda table and compensation table, the setup parameters for the function, the step table, the rate table, um, some lambda delay information and also some logging and uh, there will be some information on errors as well. So what is the closed loop lambda? Um, basically we use a lambda sensor, wideband lambda sensor into the ECU and what the function does is it keeps an eye on the lambda sensor uh, for what reading it's giving uh, we also have a aim lambda which is our lambda table and the closed loop function sort of works out if there's a difference between our aim lambda which is where we want the lambda to be and the actual lambda sensor reading. Now if there's a difference it will modify the fuel pulse width either up or down to get rid of that error. So uh, closed loop if, if you want a, a bit more of an explanation of uh, what a closed loop function is you can look at my uh, PID webinars. Just one major thing to remember um, the wideband lambda control any changes that it makes to the fueling is not a permanent change to the fuel table. Okay so as soon as the function is turned off the fuel table goes back to whatever you tuned it to. So what we more or less use this for is just to cope with some unforeseen sort of situations where maybe your compensations aren't quite right or maybe uh, you know the fuel pressures sort of changing for an unknown reason and it's just a bit of a safety margin. Um, it's not used for um, huge changes of, of fueling, uh, it's just more used for a little bit of trimming um, over and above what you've done on the dyno previously. What it uses is a, is a couple of trims. One is the short term trim. Now this is an instantaneous reaction. So if the ECU or the closed loop lambda function works out that there's a difference between the actual lambda from the sensor and the aim lambda from the table, uh, it instantly reacts and modifies the fuel pulse width based on a, on a few different parameters which we'll discuss. So instantaneously trying to get rid of that error and get the lambda actual from the sensor to meet our aim table. It also has a long term trim. Now this is a reaction to the trend more or less. So if for some reason the short term trim always needs to be richening up the mixture by adding in more fuel, the long term trim can slowly but surely just wind up an overall trim in the background just to try and take some of the strain off the off the short term trim. Again if it if it was always tending towards the lean side on the on the uh, short term trim, the long term trim would slowly um, adjust that in an overall sort of manner just so again take some sort of strain off the short term trim. Um, upgrades and equipment. Basically what the ECU needs is just a wideband lambda input. Um, the function is, is a, a standard function on our current model ECUs um, but you can get your lambda signal from uh, any of our you know, lambda devices or with a direct sensor wired straight to the ECU. Now if it's wired straight to the ECU uh, then you need the lambda upgrade for that ECU to read that sensor. 
if you have a, a PLM or an LTC or the new LTCN, uh, you don't need the upgrade in the ECU. So you only have to pay for one sort of Lambda device and then that's all you need because the actual function is part of the uh, software package as standard. Engine tuning. Now, as I sort of mentioned just before, um, this is not a permanent change to the fuel table, so it's not a, a classic auto-tune function. You don't sort of sit there and, and drive around the block a few times and have the ECU tune the engine for you. Like I said, we use this as a trimming function to help out what you have actually tuned, so it's not something that's going to save you your dyno time. Now, you know, because it's a, a reactive system, it's uh, reacting to what the Lambda actually is. So if you've got an engine that's got a lot of turbo boost or, or reacts very fast, you don't want to have to rely on a system uh, which reads what has happened and then adjusts it. Because I mean, you know, if the mixture's lean, you know, you should have sorted that out on the dyno. So um, as the uh, webinar goes on, this will make a little bit more sense. The lambda table and the compensation table. Now you can see that I've, uh, on most of my screens, I'll have a, a little uh, sort of list here, which sort of shows you uh, whereabouts in the software that is. So if you were looking for this table, you would simply go functions lambda control lambda table, and that would give you this lambda table here. And if you went functions lambda control comp it would give you the compensation table here. Now, what the lambda table is, is your aim value. This is what you want the lambda control um, function to control to. So in the table, we would put in the values. This one's based on load and RPM. You would put in what lambda value do you want at 6,000 revs and 80% throttle. So as that changes, the lambda control function will change and simply try to follow that. Now again, realistically, those should be the lambdas that you've tuned to on the dyno, so the trimming of this wideband lambda control function should only be fairly small. If you put a zero in that table anywhere, uh, that means that you want the function off. So as a as a rough guide, generally you might have uh, zero around idle, so you know once you've tuned your idle, you don't need the closed loop lambda control on, you know at that point. Or maybe uh, if you don't want to worry about uh, the lambda control um, having to sort out all of your high boost areas, you might have it off there. Maybe it's just on for your light load cruising, like you know your 60 to 100 um, sort of area. The Compensation table is a three-dimensional table um, down here, which quite simply is a compensation to the main table. So as a bit of an example here, I've used uh, exhaust gas temperature as, a, as an axis, and I've sort of said that as the exhaust gas temperature gets hotter and hotter and hotter, maybe I want to richen up the engine. Now this is a, a strictly additive uh, type table. So hopefully you can see down here at 800 degrees I've said to add, uh, well, take away 0 0.05 from the lambda which makes it 5% richer to hopefully cool off those exhaust valves. And as it gets hotter, the exhaust gas temperature, I've made it richer still. So it's an additive or subtractive type number. Um, it's not a percentage like some of the other compensation tables you might be used to. The setup parameters, and uh, as I've said before, this is where you find them, functions, lambda control, setup, and we've got a fair list of bits and pieces here. Um, the last three we won't be needing today because they are to do with the narrow band uh, control. So we're not interested in that for today, so I'll just be dealing with the other ones. First of all, uh, function at the very very top you can see there if we type in 2 that tells the ECU that we want to do wideband control so it's assuming that we have set up a wideband lambda channel of some description 
coming into the ECU that it can work from. The next two are our rich and lean trim limits. Now these are quite simply how far can the function go. So uh, as a rough guide I would say that you will be trimming in uh, up to 5% extra and minus 5 to lean it out. So, you know, a, a range of a, a total of 10%. Uh, so, like I said, you don't want to be relying on this function to do your tuning for you. It's just there to, to trim up the fueling if it's slightly out for something you didn't uh, get a chance to tune on the dyno or some unforeseen sort of circumstance. So, don't go putting in like 20%. Um, trims unless you really know what you're doing. The active engine temperature basically we're saying if the engine's cold or warming up we don't want this function to start because quite simply that's what our, uh, our um, engine temperature compensations are for as an example. Uh, maybe you would want to use it as uh, you know wideband lambda while the engine's warming up so maybe in your compensation table uh, you would have engine temperature in there so that you could uh, keep track of the lambdas you want as the engine was cool and warming up. Um, a diagnostic engine temperature uh, basically uh, this is a bit of a um, uh, logic on the function as to when it works uh, basically we don't want the sensor to be diagnosed as faulty uh, if it's working and the and the engines cool so as a rough guide there if you have a look at the default setting it will be about 70 degrees about 10 degrees below the active engine temperature so it's probably a pretty good starting point uh, the diagnostic error delay this one's quite important uh, basically it simply says if there is some problem how long does the function wait to uh, declare the sensor faulty well it's more specifically it's more or less that the reading or the, or the control is faulty so what we're saying is if something um, goes wrong we just sort of want to wait for maybe 10 to 30 seconds for the uh, ECU to declare the function um, uh, faulty and turn it off once the function is declared faulty, um, quite simply you will need to reset the ECU uh, to uh, restart the function. It will simply turn it off. Obviously if we're dealing with the, the fueling of the engine, if there's any problems we don't want um, it to be affected by our lambda control turning off. Again, this sort of leads back to my point of making sure the engine is, is nice and well tuned before you use this function. Okay, the diagnostic error, uh, as we'll show later, can be from the rich and lean limits, not so much just the sensor being faulty. Sensor selection, um, most of our ECUs have the option for uh, two lambda sensors or one, so in the lambda sensor selection you can sort of specify which sensor you actually want to use whether you want to use just lambda 1 just lambda 2 or there are a couple of combinations of where we would use the odd numbered cylinders as lambda 1 and the even numbered cylinders as lambda 2 for example like on a, a Chev V8 there's also an option for the guys with uh, maybe the Ford V8s where they have the first uh, half of the cylinder numbering as lambda 1, so 1, 2, 3, 4, and lambda 2 would do 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's a couple of different options depending on how your uh, cylinders are numbered and how many sensors you actually have. Uh, it will only give you the option for the two lambda channels, so not individual cylinders if you have uh, eight LTCs or anything like that. Recovery delay if we have any functions that more or less interrupt uh, our fueling or our ignition we obviously don't want to try and control lambda while those are happening for example our gear change ignition cut or our RPM limiting uh, if we're cutting ignition the lambda sensor will read falsely lean because we haven't burnt any of the oxygen so while those functions are on we don't want to have to use wideband lambda control so the ECU will automatically suspend the function and then what we need to do is give it an idea of how quickly does it come back on now this will make a little bit more sense uh, 
as I go through this webinar, but effectively we allow uh, a certain number of update rate before the function comes back in and this will make a bit more sense in a couple of pages. Um, we also have a warm-up delay. Now this is once the active engine temperature is reached how long before the function is started. So it's just another bit of logic. So maybe you'll say I want it to wait 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, a good example of this is if you turn the car off and then you go start it again for your next round. Um, what you might have is the engine temperature is already active, which means the lambda control wants to turn on, uh, but the sensor will still be warming up because it's been off for a while. So the idea would be just to make sure that when you turn the engine back on and it's up to operating temperature that you just give the lambda sensor a little bit of time to sort itself out because the lambda sensors can take up to about 20 seconds to come online if they're cool um, so just give it a bit of time so maybe 10 to 20 seconds something like that is probably a good starting point but uh, you'll be able to see that in the logging and, and how long your lambda sensor takes to come online from starting a hot engine Um, the long-term filter, I put this on a separate page so I could have a couple of diagrams which uh, is going to help explain what it is. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have a short-term trim and a long-term trim. Now, our long-term filter, it basically says how long does the ECU keep an eye on the short-term trim as maybe a, a filtered value to decide what it's going to do with the long-term trim. Now up the top here I've put um, we have in red our aim lambda value which is 0.97 and I also have our actual lambda value of 0.98 so this engine's running slightly leaner than we want to so with the short-term trim you can see that based on the rate which I'll explain later we keep adding, adding, adding fuel. Now I've done this on the simulator just to keep uh, things fairly simple. That's why the short term trim is making no effect to the lambda. I just want to give you an example of what's happening by holding a, a steady state error. So you can see that the short term trim steps up quite quickly up to my 5%. And you'll notice down here in the orange circle that slowly but surely the long term trim sort of adds fuel, adds fuel, because we've basically got a trend that the engine is lean all the time, so the short-term trim is instantly reacting to that and adding fuel, adding fuel. But if it's always tending towards adding fuel, what we can do is we can have a long-term trim which sort of says, well, look, overall this engine's a bit lean. So we'll have a, a long-term overall trim, and then the short-term trim can deal with the the quick reactions. So I've got some logging at the end of the uh, end of the um, webinar, which will sort of show you uh, a bit better from uh, an actual running engine. But 60 is probably a recommended starting point. Um, that's uh, you know, if you make the numbers larger, it will slow it down. If you made the number say 30, this uh, long-term trim would move up faster with the lower number of 30. So something you can probably experiment with and it really depends on your engine. This stuff still needs to be sort of tuned to the situation rather than just uh, throwing in like the example numbers. Rate. Our rate table is a function which calculates the more or less the update of the lambda reading. So what we're trying to say here is how quickly do I take a reading of lambda from the sensor to use in my lambda control function. Now generally speaking we'll have this related to injector duty cycle. So what I'm saying here is at 10% duty cycle I want to wait 1.5 seconds for each update of the uh, lambda sensor. But as the duty cycle gets higher, we're going to spend less time. So at 60% duty cycle, which would sort of more or less relate to higher RPM, higher load, we're going to say that we've only got like 0.31 seconds. So it's a much quicker update. 
So the basic idea is as things are happening faster, we've got more exhaust flow. It means we can take quicker readings to update our calculation of our lambda error and therefore what to do with the injectors. Now this is based pretty much on what's called a, a transport delay or a lambda delay. Now I do have a, a uh, slide on this a bit later which will you know, give you an example of uh, what I'm talking about. But this table is quite important. This needs to be tested and to get right. It doesn't take very long uh, but it needs to be set quite accurately and that will make a bit more sense a bit later on. Step, effectively what the ECU does in this calculation is it will say, okay, I have a, a lambda error of say, you know, let's say 0.1 and with our step table we are saying, okay, if I've got a lambda error of 0.1, how much of that do I use in my calculation of how much to increase or decrease my injector pulse width by? Now what we're sort of saying here is just try to take care of 80% of the error for each step because the steps are happening reasonably quickly so we can always update that um, on the next calculation if it's not quite enough. Uh, if you go a bit too far then suddenly what you can have is you can have what's called a lambda control hunt where if you try to get rid of all of the error all at once you may overstep the mark and then the calculation simply has to reverse and go backwards and forwards and you never quite get the lambda you want because you're, you're trying to take uh, two bigger steps to get rid of all the error. And the other thing you've got to remember is especially on the track the engine RPM and load are moving around quite quickly as well so you might be sort of uh, you know having too much of a step with each of your lambda control calculations you know and it might not produce any good results after all anyway so you know this is a way of more or less uh, slowing down the reaction of the lambda control and if you want a, a bit of an analogy uh, you could uh, sort of think of this as the proportional gain of a, of a PID function again if you want to watch my uh, closed loop control PID webinars so this is a 2D table um, you know you could modify this based on pretty much any channel but uh, generally speaking we uh, most of us here would stick to just the 80% single value which seems to work quite well remember you do have your lambda rate table as well that can change the speed at which the uh, the function works also. Now what I'm talking about with lambda delay, here's a little test I did on my own car in the car park here just to get an idea of what is the lambda delay or the transport delay. So the explanation of that is the lambda sensor is obviously a reasonable distance down the exhaust system so let's say one meter, maybe one and a half meters depending on your exhaust system. Now if I make a change to the pulse width or the air fuel ratio or the lambda that obviously has to get burnt in the exhaust and then it's going to take a while for that new mixture to reach the lambda sensor. So as you can see here what I've done is I've got a, my pulse width here and I've instantaneously put in a big uh, step change to make the engine richer and you'll notice here that on the purple line that's the actual lambda reading you can see that there's uh, a reasonable delay for that um, new mixture to reach the lambda sensor uh, in my case I had a, a turbocharger and then the uh, lambda sensor was probably a meter and a half down the exhaust system from the actual cylinder head so you know with gas velocities and everything obviously it's going to take a certain amount of time for my new mixture to reach the sensor so for wideband lambda control we need to have an idea of what the lambda delay is so that we don't try to over calculate our lambda control this case it was 0.55 seconds at about 4000 revs that's RPM up the top there so what I'm saying here is if I tried to calculate for you know whatever duty cycle of the injector is if I tried to say calculate at 0.25 seconds in my lambda rate table I would have two updates 
based on information that hadn't changed based on the first one. So it might sound a little confusing, but you know, just the idea is don't try to make the second calculation before the first one has actually reached the sensor. So this test here is quite important. So my limitation is this lambda delay, which at that load is an RPM is 0.55 seconds. So in my rate table, I would have to say at this situation, my lambda delay might be say 0.6 seconds. 0.25 seconds, I'm going to make two calculations before the first one's even reached. So, you know, the ECU is going to make two updates to the um, mixture, and I'm probably going to end up rich. I'm going to get to this lambda control hunting again. So, this is another thing you should also check for things like gear change ignition cut, maybe clipping the RPM limiter, because what you will have is you'll get a um, lean spike from the gear change ignition cut but then you'll notice that it will take a certain amount of time to recover and fill the exhaust system back up again with gear change ignition cut I'm cutting the ignition therefore I'm not burning the oxygen which means my lambda sensor will read rich and once the engine comes back on you'll notice in your lambda sensor reading from your data logging that will be a certain amount of time that it takes before the lambda reading gets back to normal you need to make sure that you don't try to start calculating again on based on information that's from the gear change ignition cut event so that would be your recovery delay okay so how many samples so to calculate my recovery delay if I had say instead of 0.55 seconds for my gear change ignition cut it was 0.11 second oh sorry 1.1 seconds that sort of means that I need two updates so my lambda recovery would be two so the lambda recovery simply says um, how many samples do you want if I put in two it's going to simply look at the rate table see what the rate is in this case 0.55 it's going to say 0.55 times two 1.1 thereabouts and it's simply going to say okay well we're going to wait that long during a gear change ignition cut event and then start again okay so again this logging and this testing for your lambda delay is quite important and it will make a big difference to your lambda control these are you know the refinements that you need to make sure the lambda control doesn't try to calculate on situations which are, aren't relevant RPM limiters gear change ignition cut and also uh, the fact that the lambda new mixture hasn't quite reached the sensor yet so quite an important part of this system and probably where you should spend uh, a fair bit of time just to work out what is actually going on in your system this will change based on engine type uh, exhaust system type exhaust system size all that kind of thing so needs to be tested uh, again this is quite an important part of the whole function logging if we're going to data log obviously we want to log the long-term trims the short-term trims um, if you have a, a long-term trim just a, a bit of a note on rates you can probably log the long-term trim at a fairly low rate maybe maybe uh, two to five Hertz or something like that because it doesn't change very fast um, the short-term trim will change quite quickly so you need to log that quite quickly so maybe uh, I don't know 20 to 50 Hertz as a as an example uh, and also you want to log the lambda errors um, you want to log the the error group that includes lambda now it when you use the lambda control the lambda error is the same lambda error flag that would be used just for simply a lambda sensor error so when you've got the function on the lambda error is for the function when you've got the function off the lambda sensor error is just for the sensor but make sure you log it um, because you'll be able to be able to see what's going on if the function for some reason doesn't work and just down the bottom here I've got a bit of an example in the uh, goldie color that's my short-term trim and you can see at this point here at the beginning it's more tending towards um, being uh, 
rich so it's pulling fuel out so you can see that the long term trim and I've just taken a bit of a screen capture halfway through the event starts to come down but then you see that after all this is starting to tend towards needing to richen the engine up so the long term trim starts to go up again okay so you need to log those two things errors the way an error would happen is if either the long term trim or the short term trim goes to their maximum value for the diagnostic error delay. Uh, that diagnostic error delay is something we would have set. In this case it's 10 seconds so you can see here that I've still got my steady state error from my uh, little simulation on the bench here and because I've got the error and it's a little bit leaner the short term trim winds up based on my rate table and it keeps adding 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 and the whole time also my long term trim is coming up and you can see that I've got to the maximum I set uh, the trim limits rich and lean to be 5 and minus 5 that's uh, what I'd recommend as a, as a basic area that you're going to be using maybe up to 10 and minus 10 uh, if you're going a little bit further outside that it's you probably better to uh, give the engine a bit better tune on the dyno in the first place I suppose but what we can see here is it's maxed out on the short term trim for 10 seconds at this point here the system goes into error and you can see that the ECU slowly winds out the two trims and at this point we're in error so the ECU simply said there's something wrong with the wideband lambda control and in this case it's simply because we haven't tuned the engine well enough to begin with it's put the function into error not the sensor we'll still get the reading uh, from our logging so it won't turn off the lambda sensor it just turns off the control now at this point the function will not come back on until the ECU power has been reset so it's like a more or less a protection system we know there's something wrong we will turn the function off to not make matters any worse so you need to look at your logging and see why am I maxing out my short term trim and that will simply because our tuning's not good enough and what you want to do is you'll probably look at the logging and think oh gee the uh, wideband lambda control is not working anymore this is why you log the lambda error at this point here the ECU logging or if we've got the laptop online uh, it will sort of show us that the lambda is in error and uh, that'll be because quite simply our trims have gone too long just another point the wideband lambda control function does not work in any of the fuel tables if we've got the laptop connected and we are tuning on the uh, dyno and we're tuning in the main fuel table or any of the fuel compensations the ECU will not try to use the wideband lambda control obviously if the ECU is trying to control fueling and we're trying to change it there's going to be a bit of a mismatch of what's going on and uh, things are going to look, get a little confusing so one thing to sort of have a look at if you think your wideband lambda control should be on and you're watching this on your laptop just make sure you're not in the any of the fuel screens uh, probably just go to the main ignition screen is something I normally do and that will sort of bring the function on Okay, thanks everyone for attending this MoTeC webinar. Uh, I hope it's been informative. Uh, as with all webinars, these will be recorded and put up onto our website uh, hopefully later this week. Uh, also, if you're not already a member of our uh, MoTeC forum, you should uh, join that as well. So you've got um, some other sort of area of support. Uh, when we go home at night, um, you know, it's a bit hard to get support, but uh, there's plenty of guys around the world who are in different time zones. You simply put your question up on the forum and it should be answered nice and quickly. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for attending and I hope you can uh, attend more of our webinars. Thank you.